Hello, friends. Happy Feast of St. Luke. Uh, today, I was just, I just have so much I wanted to share with you. Now, our Dewey Rames Bible just has very little on St. Luke. It's right at the beginning of his gospel. It says St. Luke was a native of Antioch, which was the capital of Syria at that time. He was by profession a doctor, a physician, and many ancient writers say that he was very skillful in painting. In modern times, we know Our Lady of Chesicoa and other icons have been attributed to him. Can we say definitively? Well, no, but he was also a very good painter in words because he has the infancy narrative as well. Let's see. He became a disciple. He was converted by Paul. He became his disciple and companion in his travels, fellow laborer in the gospel. He wrote in Greek. And again, today I heard that he was actually a very good writer in Greek. His Greek is very high level. And he wrote about 24 years after our Lord's ascension. It was such a little tidbit that I went and grabbed You should uh, the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. I only have the new testament edition but it's now been released in its full form i can't imagine how big that must be but it has so much here i mean it is on the author the structure the date the destination um and then there is an outline as well and then it, it gets into it and it has so so many notes so many notes um and lots of word studies in there. Well, why that's important. Um, this morning, like I said, the Marian fathers were challenging people to read the Gospels. Just read it as you would a book. But also, um, and, and that is a lovely idea. I know so many of us have done the different Bible in a year programs. And we've done that perhaps without context or with context just added by our favorite narrator or commentator, whoever that was, whether it was Father Mike Schmitz or someone else. But this this Bible has a lot more notes and studies. Um, so I would say, go ahead. I would read it once through. They're fairly, you know, the gospel is fairly short. Read it once through and then come back and maybe do the word studies. Then maybe come back and do the footnotes. Make it a nice study. Now, I know th there are books designed to do this. Um, you know, you can get these individually done. Uh, Bible Timeline, Jeff Cavins, they all have them written out separately. But I'm going to invite you to try and get a big book like this, and you can almost do your own study on it. So let's look a little bit more here, learn a little bit more about St. Luke. It says, early manuscripts of the third gospel are titled According to Luke. This heading serves as a signpost of apostolic tradition for the earliest Christians unanimously ascribed the work to Luke, a Gentile physician and companion of the Apostle Paul, as mentioned in 2 Timothy 4.11 and Philomenon 24. Several church fathers, such as Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Clement of Alexandria, assert Luke's authorship of the third gospel. In an anonymous list of New Testament books called the Muratorian Fragment, which is from around 170 also attaches his name to it. There is thus no reason to doubt Luke's authorship of the gospel, since tradition is virtually uncontested in early Christianity. Luke himself is unique among the writers of in the New Testament. He is the only Gentile author to compose a New Testament book. All others were of Israelite descent. Paul hints at his Gentile identity when he numbers Luke, the beloved physician, among his uncircumcised companions. That's a little awkward. He did that in Colossians 4. 14. Secondly, Luke is the only evangelist to write a sequel. In addition to his gospel, he wrote the Acts of the Apostles as the second part of a two-volume work. The book of Acts picks up where Luke's gospel narrative ends, showing how the Holy Spirit's work in the life of Jesus now operates in the living community of Christ's mystical body, the church. The destination. Uh, we've discussed this before in this channel. Luke addressed his gospel to Theophilus. Uh, possibly a Roman official who agreed to finance the publication of the work. I thought it was just a pseudonym, but maybe not. If this is so, Luke may have intended his gospel to be circulated and read more widely through the patronage of Theophilus. His larger intended audience probably included the Gentile Christians throughout the Mediterranean world, as well as Israelites and Samaritans living among them in the diaspora. For the sake of the Gentile readers, Luke sometimes omits Semitic words or simply replaces them with their Greek equivalents to make his story more readable for believers unfamiliar with Aramaic. 
Yet Luke is also very sophisticated in his use of the Old Testament. Although few direct citations appear in his gospel, allusions and echoes of the Old Testament abound. This makes it likely that Luke was directing his message not only to the Gentile world, but also to readers long familiar with the scriptures of Israel. And that is why, friends, I want you to read it not just as a book, but read the notes, because we are not going to get those allusions either. It may be the easiest to get those allusions because he was writing more for a Gentile audience and did include those things, but perhaps we need a little bit more help. Um, let's just look at one word study, just informed, used in Luke 1.4. Let's look at Luke 1.4. Ah, he's just saying, it seemed goodly to me all, also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, the most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. So a word study on informed. It has it here in Greek. Please don't make me try and read that. It means to instruct or to teach orally and is the basis of our English word catechis catechism. Okay, so catecheo, maybe. The verb is used eight times in the New Testament is often linked with the early transmission of the gospel when the apostles and their associates instructed believers by word of mouth. Luke writes his gospel to a certain Theophilus, who has already been catechized in this way, in order to confirm and deepen his understanding of Jesus' life and teaching. Apollos had likewise learned the rudiments of Christian doctrine by oral instruction, Acts 18.25. Paul employs this term years earlier when he encourages young Christians to assist their local catechists with financial support, Galatians 6.6. 6 and when he stresses that intelligible instruction in the faith is more profitable for God's people than unintelligible speech of charismatic tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 19. Very interesting. And so you can see that little word study in here is definitely valuable. So studying the Gospel of Luke, this may be of great help to you. Um, I then grabbed my Catechism of the Council of Trent. And Luke isn't in the index because... That's not what the catechism is. I went to the lessons looking around for this week um, here for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. And this is fairly close to where we are. Um, it recommended in the sermon program the dogmatic subject of the ceremonies in the Mass. I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ from Ephesians 3.14. And the moral subject, the third commandment, remember thou keep holy the Sabbath day. And the quote here is Jesus answering, spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And that is from Luke 14, 3. So I thought I'd go a little different than other people are probably doing today and look at these passages. So it takes us back. Again, this is the, the Tan Books edition. So if I'm giving page numbers, that's where I'm sending you. Page 276 does talk about the rites and ceremonies in the Mass. The sacrifice of the Mass is celebrated with many solemn rites and ceremonies, none of which should be deemed useless or superfluous. On the contrary, all of them tend to display the majesty of this august sacrifice and to excite the faithful when beholding these saving mysteries to contemplate the divine things which lie concealed in the Eucharistic sacrifice. On these rites and ceremonies, we shall not dwell since they require a more lengthy exposition than is compatible with the nature of the present work. Moreover, priests can easily consult on the subject some of the many booklets and works that have been written by pious and learned men. What has been said so far will, with divine assistance, be found sufficient to explain the principal things which regard the Holy Eucharist both as a sacrament and a sacrifice. Very lovely. And it references you here to the ceremonies of the Mass. See Summa Logica Theologica, the Summa Theologica, 3a. Um, and that's listed. I'll try and put that in the comments below where you can find that. I want to also let you know that the Mass profits both the living and the dead. And as we are in October, heading into November, the Feast of All Saints and All Souls, I thought that would be profitable to read as well. Pastors should teach that such is the efficacy of this sacrifice, and that its benefits extend not only to the celebrant and the communicant, but to all the faithful, whether living with us on earth, or already numbered with those who are dead in the Lord, but whose sins have not yet been fully expiated. For according to the most authentic apostolic tradition, it is not less available when offered for them than when offered for the sins of the living, their punishments, satisfactions, calamities, and difficulties of every sort. And it's referring to the Catechism, oh, the Council of Trent, sorry, not the Catechism, but the Council of Trent, Session 22, 
cap six and can eight. I don't know what the cap six is, but can is possibly can and eight. It is hence easy to perceive that all masses as being conducive to the common interest and salvation of all the faithful are to be considered common to all. The, the mass, attending the mass, profits both the living and the dead, whether they are there or not. Um, and I want to say that as important, because I want you to attend the mass, um, watching it on live stream is certainly profitable for you, better than not attending at all. But I want you to get back. I know so many people have not gone back to mass and to have it offered for others as another valuable thing to have done. You you hear that in the beginning of the Mass, this Mass has been offered for so-and-so. And you may think, well, I can't do that. I Most dioceses, I've not heard of one that has not, have those priced at like $5 a Mass. That's American dollars. They are priced reasonably so that all of the laity can do that. And that's and if you can't afford that, speak to the pastor. I'm sure he'll make arrangements. They are not to make a profit. It is a very minimal donation. Are you welcome to give more? You are certainly welcome to give more. But it is just meant to be a sacrifice. It's a free will donation. But it is some sacrifice on your part offering up for the Mass for the other. So you're entering into that sacrifice in some small way. The third commandment, it talks about... Um, Go back. It talks about the third commandment here. That's what it sent us back to for the moral lesson. Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy works. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no work on it. Neither shall, neither thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy beast, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are in them and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. And that is from Exodus 28 through 11. It does talk about <coughs> the reasons for the commandment. And that ties into what we we're just talking about. The commandment of the law rightly and in due order prescribes the external worship, which we owe to God. For it is, as it were, a consequent of the preceding commandment. For if we sincerely and devoutly worship God, guided by the faith and hope we have in him, we cannot but honor him with external worship and thanksgiving. Now, since we cannot easily discharge these duties while occupied in worldly affairs, a certain fixed time has been set aside so it may be conveniently performed. It then does talk about the importance of the instruction of this commandment, that there is wondrous fruit and advantage. I want you to grab this book and read this whole section, but I will tell you it goes into the importance of the instruction of the commandment. Um, for one thing, the importance of its observance for the faithful may be inferred from the consideration that those who carefully comply with it are more easily induced to keep all the other commandments. And that is so important. There was a recent study, I'm gonna, I will link that in the description below, a recent study done of which interviewed more Catholics than has been done in recent memory. And it was included about the real presence of the Eucharist. And those who attended Mass daily were more likely to believe in the real presence of the Eucharist. And the things they said that helped, helped make that real to them were kneeling when receiving, receiving on the tongue, having the altar, these things like that. So I, I think... It tells you here, the importance of the observance for the faithful may be inferred from the consideration that those who carefully comply with it are more easily induced to keep all of the other commandments. And I, I would extend that, that you are more likely to believe the other beliefs. How this third commandment differs from other commandments, and this comes up a lot um, with our non-Catholic followers, with regard to the exposition of this commandment, the faithful are carefully to be taught how it agrees with and how it differs from the others, nor that they may understand why we observe and keep holy, not Saturday, but Sunday. The point of difference is evident. The other commandments of the Decalogue are precepts of the natural law, obligatory at all times and unalterable. Hence, after the abrogation of the law of Moses, all of the commandments contained in the two tables are observed by Christians, not indeed because their observance is commanded by Moses, but because they are in conformity with nature, which dictates obedience to them. 
This commandment about the observance of the Sabbath, on the other hand, considered as to the time and appointed for its fulfillment, is not fixed and unalterable, but susceptible of change, and belongs not to the moral, but the ceremonial law. Neither is it a principle of natural law. We are not instructed by nature to give external worship to God on that day rather than any other. And in fact, the Sabbath was kept holy only from the time of liberation of the people of Israel from the bondage of Pharaoh. The observance of the Sabbath was to be abrogated at the same time as the other Hebrew rites and ceremonies, that is, at the death of Christ. Having been, as it were, images which foreshadowed the light and the truth, these ceremonies were to disappear at the coming of that light and truth, which is Jesus Christ. Hence, St. Paul, in his epistle to the Galatians, when reproving the observers of the Mosaic rites, say, You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest perhaps I have labored in vain amongst you. Galatians 4.10. And he writes to the same effect to the Colossians, Colossians 2.16. So much regarding the difference between this and the other commandments. How is the third commandment like other commandments? It then goes into the Jewish Sabbath changed to Sunday by the apostles. The apostles therefore resolved to consecrate the first day of the week to the divine worship and called it the Lord's Day. St. John in the Apocalypse makes mention of the Lord's Day, Apocalypse one ten, and the Apostle commands collections to be made on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16.2. That is, according to the interpretation of St. Chrysostom on the Lord's Day. From all this we learn that even then the Lord's Day was kept holy in the church. It then breaks the commandment into four parts. Four parts. Have you ever studied the commandments in this way? It's available for you in the Catechism of of the Council of Trent. It was originally written for pastors to be effective teachers, but you may read it too. It is effective in instruction. Okay, friends, that was a lot for one day um, on the Feast of St. Luke. Let's jump in and do St. Francis's prayer before the crucifix and then go, oh, St. Francis's prayer for all the orders and then go off into, back into our work day. Almighty, immortal, just, and merciful God, give to us poor creatures to do for you that which we know to be your will, and to will always that which is well-pleasing to you, so that inwardly purified, illumined, and enkindled by the flame of your Holy Spirit, we may be enabled to follow in the footprints of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and by your grace at length attain to you the Most High, who in perfect trinity and simple unity live and reign, God all-powerful, forever and ever. Amen. In omni patris affiliate spiritus sancti. Amen.